When we hear about the March on Washington that happened in 1963, um, you know, we think about Martin's famous I Have a Dream speech and the masses of people. We probably think about the pictures that are famous from that march um, of all the people that were in attendance. And hopefully now you think about Daisy Bates because last week we talked about how she was the only woman to give a speech that day at the March on Washington. But I don't think we put much thought into just how much planning went into something as big as that. Um, the mastermind and the planner was also the advisor, one of the advisors to Martin Luther King Jr., who was just as vocal about his blackness as he was his sexuality. Season 2, Episode 6, This is Black History Moments, a podcast dedicated to telling the stories of Black historical figures that I feel don't get the adequate attention and recognition that they deserve. And my name is Shakira. This is the story of Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin was born March 17, 1912 in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and there were a lot of children in the home when he was growing up, and by a lot, I mean 12. He was raised by Jennifer and Julia Rustin, and he grew up thinking that Jennifer and Julia were his parents. Come to find out, they were actually his grandparents, and who he thought was one of his sisters, her name was Florence, she was actually his mother. Um, she was young, though, and that's actually a really common story where grandparents raise the grandchild like their own when their daughter it's usually daughters, when their daughter has a child, especially back in the day, like a child without being married and a child really young, they will just take the child and raise it as their own and it'll just be like a family secret. But okay, continuing on. Bayard's family based their way of living on Quaker values. So they were big on nonviolence, peace, and accepting people, human beings. And this proved to be a big thing for how Bayard moved throughout the rest of his life. When he was in high school, it's said that he told his grandmother that he was more interested in men than he was women, and she was still accepting of him. She told him that she was less concerned about him dating men, but more concerned with the quality of men that he chose. And I know that's right. Go ahead, Grandma. So Bayer graduates from high school at Westchester High, and he goes on to enroll in college, a few colleges. He first attended Wilberforce, try to say that three times fast, a university in Ohio. After a while there, he went on to Cheney State Teachers College, which is now Cheney University in Pennsylvania. After a stint there, he moved to New York City in 1937, and he went to City College of New York. Now, he never earned a degree from any of these schools, but I like to think that maybe he just got what he needed to learn from the different institutions and just moved on. So while he was at City College in New York, he joined the Young Communist League because initially he was attracted to their ideas. He liked what they had to say about racial segregation and the fight for civil rights. But when the start of World War II rolls around, he starts to notice some funny business going on in this organization. And he notices that the league's support started shifting towards the Soviet Union and it became less and less about racial injustices, practices, and civil rights here in the United States. So he left the party. After he left the Young Communist League, he shifted his sights towards socialism and he joined four. F-O-R, in 1941, and FOR stood for the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Now, FOR was led by a man named A.J. Must, and they advocated for, quote, peace, labor rights, and equality for all people, unless those people were gay, end quote. But we know that Bayard was gay, like he was a gay man, so there's some conflicts going on there. While he was with Four, he co-founded CORE, 
which was the Congress of Racial Equality, and he would travel the country speaking and giving workshops on nonviolent action and how people could get involved in civil rights. Well, the war is still going on, World War II, and Bayard refused to serve. He didn't show up for his draft. Um, he didn't agree to any alternative services, so they sentenced him to three years in prison. He only served two years, though, and the charge was conscientious objection to serving in the war. So even though he was behind bars, he did not let that stop him from protesting how he felt about segregation because even when he was in there, he spoke about the segregated facilities in the prison system while he was there. So Bayer ended up doing a lot that will become the foundation of major civil rights moments that we know today. When he was released from prison, he stayed involved and ended up getting back to that group that he co-founded, CORE, or the Congress of Racial Equality. And they decided that they wanted to test out a Supreme Court ruling that happened in 1946. That ruling was Morgan versus Virginia. And hopefully it's okay if I rap a little bit about Miss Morgan into this episode. It's almost like you get a two for one deal in today's episode. So if you go to the Instagram page and you take a look at yesterday's Black History Facts we posted, you'll see Miss Irene Morgan. And that's who this ruling was about. See, Irene refused to give up her seat on the bus more than a decade before Rosa Parks and Claudette Colvin. Hopefully you remember Claudette's story because we had an episode on her last season, but okay. Irene was on a Greyhound bus heading back home to Baltimore. She was recovering from a recent miscarriage that she suffered, and I think it's important to, you know, I think it's important to note that because so often when we recount the stories of people who made these courageous acts, it's often in a context of, wow, they were so brave. Oh, my gosh, they were heroes. And I think that we forget to humanize them. This was a woman that was in her 20s. She had just lost the baby. She was staying with her mother, recovering from the miscarriage, and she started feeling ill. So she wanted to go back home to Baltimore so she could go to a doctor's appointment. So that's the setup for this story. So she just wanted to get home to this appointment. And I imagine that they just caught her on a very, very bad day. So she boards this bus, this Greyhound bus, and she sits in the back of the bus in the designated area for black people. About 30 minutes into the drive, a white couple boards the Greyhound, and the bus driver told Irene that she needed to give her seat up to the couple, and she refused. I'm guessing because maybe the bus was full, um, full in the front, so they were pushing the black people further back into the bus to make room. So... He tells her to get up for this couple, and she refused. And so the bus driver was like, okay, well, I'll just drive to the local jail since she won't get up. And Irene, in my mind, she was like, okay, do it. They get to the local jail, and one of the sheriff's officers, he comes on the bus, and he has a warrant for Irene's arrest. Irene takes the warrant and rips it up in front of his face. So he tries to pull her off this bus, and that was probably the worst decision that he could have made that day because when he tries to pull her off, she kicked him where the sun don't shine. I don't know if that's just a Southern saying, but if you don't know what that means, she kicked him below the belt. So another officer comes on the bus, and he's like, listen, lady. I will beat you with this nightstick if you don't get off this bus. And Irene replies, well, we'll whip each other then. She was just so, she's my spirit animal. Okay, so she eventually, you know, after putting up a really good fight, they drag her off this bus and she's arrested. At her trial, she pled guilty for resisting arrest, but not guilty for violating segregation laws because She's sitting in the section of the bus for black people. Now, with this, she was ordered to pay $10 for violating state laws. And her lawyer was adamant about it, so much so that he appealed it all the way up to the Supreme Court. 
this case started catching a lot of traction and attention, especially from the NAACP. We talked about the NAACP last week, too, in reference to Daisy Bates. So the NAACP hears what's going on with this case, and they're like, okay, we can do something with this. So they sent Thurgood Marshall and William Hastie down to see what this is all about. And I think we all know, for the most part, who Thurgood Marshall um, was. William Hasty at this point, Maybe it wasn't at this point. Maybe it was a little bit later. He ended up becoming the president of Howard University's law school. So in 1946, almost two years after this incident happened, that's when the Supreme Court case of Irene Morgan versus the Commonwealth of Virginia started. Now, Thurgood Marshall and William Hasty, they argued that Virginia state laws were a violation of interstate commerce in layman's terms. There was no federal act or law that said um, races need to be separated on interstate transportation. And if that's the case, then when people are traveling, you can't make them change seats as they go through different states because state laws can't supersede federal laws. Now, needless to say, they won. And Greyhound and other interstate travel companies, they were ordered to institute a desegregated policy. However, we know what country we're living in and we know the time frame in which this is happening. So drivers and bus companies in some states, mostly southern states, refused to acknowledge this decision. They were like, OK, and who's going to check us? Nobody. Enter Bayard Rustin. This is what he had to do with all of this. And I know I say this all the time, literally all the time, but I just love it when people's stories connect like this. It's like, do you remember those puzzles when you were a kid and you had to make a picture, but you had to connect the dots and the dots were numbered. So you draw from dot one to dot two to dot three. And by the time you get to the end, you have a full picture. That's what this is to me like I feel like each episode is like me connecting a dot to build a bigger picture but all right now our dear Bayard he is a master organizer and strategist and he gets eight white people and eight black people together to test and see if these southern states were complying with these new laws he called it the Journey of Reconciliation, and they rode interstate buses through four different southern states, and they would ride and sing a protest song. Um, the name of the song was You Don't Have to Ride Jim Crow, and in the song, there was a lyric that said, get on the bus, sit any place, because Irene Morgan won her case. Now, 12 of the 16 bus riders were arrested for refusing to move to segregated seating during the rides. Bayer was one of those arrests, but what Bayer did with this journey of reconciliation was important because this, like what he set up with this, these rides, was exactly what the Freedom Rides that we know so well that John Lewis participated in, um, this is what they based their model on. Like, that's cool, right? No? Just me? Okay. So, <laughs> Bayard was arrested, and he spends 22 days in a chain gang in North Carolina. Now, after he served his time on the chain gang, he had several articles printed in different papers about the unjust practices of chain gangs, and that eventually helped lead to reform of prison chain gangs. That's cool to me, too. So about a year later, Bayard takes a trip to India, and there he learned more about peaceful protests, civil disobedience, and nonviolent strategies. And this was a little bit after the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. Um, so yeah, it was a lot going on at this time. But when he got back to the United States, he wrote one of his more famous quotes, and it was kind of based on everything that he learned over in India. And it says, quote, we need in every community a group of angelic troublemakers, end quote. Now, a few years pass, and Bayer is still organizing and working on desegregation, but in 1953, he was forced to resign from four. Why? Well, 
because that year he was arrested in Pasadena, California on a moral charge and he was also ordered to register as a sex offender. Why was he asked to do that? I'm glad you asked. He was found in a car with another man. So it's after this that people start to weaponize Bayard's sexuality against him. And everything just starts getting really messy. Bayard had a mentor and his mentor's name was A. Philip Randolph. He was an activist. And Randolph was telling Bayard, hey, you really need to meet this cat. His name is Martin Luther King Jr. Right now they're down there in Montgomery. They're organizing these bus boycotts. You can help him. I already know it. So Bayard is like, okay, they go down to Montgomery to support this boycott and, you know, they hit it off basically. And he starts talking more and more to Martin um, and they start really getting along. So it's important to note that at this time, Martin was not really on the nonviolent train. (laughs) Like he had been reading Gandhi's work, but he hadn't actually really fully accepted that as a way of combating what was happening here in the United States. Um, And it said that when Bayard met Martin, Martin's house was full of guns and ammunition, not, you know, the bad kind or anything like that, like the FBI tried to make us believe. But, you know, he had enough to defend himself. But after speaking to Bayard, he really became convinced of, you know, this other way to do things nonviolently and not fighting fire with fire, which is interesting because one of Martin and Malcolm's major differences between the two, um, why they didn't see eye to eye for a while there was their difference, you know, in how to approach the movement. But it's just interesting that that wasn't even Martin's first thought initially. Okay, back to the story. I digress. They get to talking, Bayard and Martin, and they come to this conclusion that nonviolence should be at the foundation or the core of the civil rights movement. Now, Martin knew of Bayard's sexuality, but it didn't really matter to him because the man knew his stuff. (laughs) Like, he was a master organizer and strategist, and that's where Dr. King fell short. Dr. King was a great speaker. He was great with connecting with people and getting a rise out of people, yes. But Bayard was the vehicle in which those connections could be made. Like, they were really getting things rolling until you all know there's always that one person. There's always that one person. So here's a quote. And I felt like just me reading you this would give you a better insight than I could ever translate. So, quote, Randolph, King, and Rustin had begun arrangements to march at the Democratic National Convention of presidential candidate John F. Kennedy and his running mate Lyndon B. Johnson in Los Angeles, protesting the party's lackluster position on civil rights. In response to this, Democratic leadership sent Black Congressman Adam Clayton Powell to stop the march before it happened. He used Rustin's sexual orientation as his weapon. Prior to the convention, Powell sent an intermediary to threaten King, telling him that if they proceeded with the march, he would accuse King of having an affair with Rustin not only killing the march, but also dealing a possibly fatal blow to the movement as a whole. After consulting with his colleagues and advisors, including his close confidant, advisor, and speechwriter, Clarence Jones, Dr. King decided to distance himself from Rustin. Rustin's reluctant resignation from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference marked one of few times that King lost a battle to fear. Quote, It was a personally painful situation for him, I think, because he was disappointed that Dr. King didn't stand up for him or didn't have more backbone, says Walter Nagley, Rustin's partner at the time of his death. But in all fairness to Dr. King and to Bayard, Bayard understood that this was a political move and it was probably better for Dr. King to do what he did politically speaking in terms of the movement. In response to Powell's threat, Jones fought fire with fire. 
He told Powell if he went to the media with the fabricated rumor about King, he would litter Harlem, which was the district that Powell represented, with posters and pictures of all the women that Powell had slept with. The threat worked, and King proceeded to protest the 1960 Democratic Convention with Rustin as the sole casualty, end quote. I told y'all it was messy. (laughs) So, after all of that, Bayer distanced himself from them because he didn't want his sexuality to be something that people used against the movement, which is really sad when you think about it. But when Bayer wasn't involved from 1960 to 1963, it was almost like the movement was at a standstill. And they weren't getting much accomplished at all. And Dr. King Martin recognized that. And he knew that it was because they were missing the oil, that one piece that really kept the machine running smoothly. And that piece was Bayard. There was no denying that. So he reaches out to Bayard and gets him involved with the Birmingham campaign. So that way he could ease him back into planning for the march on Washington and it wouldn't be so abrupt to people. Now the march on Washington was the brainchild of Bayard and Randolph. Remember Randolph is Bayard's mentor and ended up being a really good friend of his but this is their brainchild from years earlier. So unfortunately Even as Bayard eased back into things, people within the movement, black people, (laughs) were not here for it. They kept saying that his involvement with the Young Communist Organization when he was young and also mostly his sexual orientation and his arrest in California from years earlier would distract from their efforts. But Martin knew that no one else would be able to plan the March on Washington like Bayard. So he and John Lewis, Martin and John Lewis, they get together and they come up with a plan. So they're like, okay, if we can just get Randolph, Bayard's mentor, to lead the march, we'll be okay because Randolph is just going to make Bayard his deputy. And then that way he'll still be involved. So they took it to caucus and their plan worked. The people elected Randolph to head the march and, you know, exactly what they expected to happen, exactly what they planned to happen is what happened. Randolph chose Bayard to be his deputy. So Bayard organized with the local D.C. police and the local hospitals just in case there were any attacks from outside people and threats of violence during the march. Um, He had 2,000 volunteer security marshals trained specifically for that day in case anything popped off. Um, And at the march, you know, once everything happened, he was the person that led... um, the list of demands. He read the list of demands that were being taken to President John F. Kennedy for the civil rights movement. Now, first on that list of demands was, quote, effective civil rights legislation, no compromise, no filibuster, and that it include public accommodations, decent housing, integrated education, fair employment, and the right to vote, end quote. And it was a success, To this day, it's still one of those events in history that we look back on in recognizing and remembering all that we've overcome. And that is because of Bayard. So after the march, he and Martin, they still work together, but they started kind of clashing and butting heads a few years later. During the Poor People's Campaign in 1968, they bumped heads. And a quote says... He supported the idea of fighting for the impoverished people of the country, but he wasn't sure of the timing and worried that it could lead to violence in already struggling communities. He voiced his opinions publicly, leading to King harboring feelings of betrayal. Rustin was once again ousted from King's planning process. But after King's assassination on April 4th, 1968, Rustin agreed to fly from Memphis to help lead the campaign in King's absence. However, with leadership within the movement opposed to his involvement, Rustin withdrew his agreement, end quote. 
But Bayard continued to fight for civil rights. And as he got older, he became more focused on gay rights. In the 80s, he became way more vocal about gay rights and his experience of being a black and gay man. And he started to bring the AIDS crisis to the attention of the NAACP, but I'm not quite sure if they actually acted on it. I didn't see any information on that. Now, Bayard passed from a ruptured appendix in New York City on August 24th, 1987 at the age of 75. 1987 was not that long ago, y'all. All right. President Barack Obama awarded him a Presidential Medal of Honor in 2013 for his works with Civil Rights and the March on Washington. And check this out. Last year, February 2020, he was pardoned for his charges in California when he was arrested for being with a man way after his death. But I guess, you know... What do they say? No time like the present or better now than later. I don't know. So that is the story of Bayard. And I hope that you will share it with someone. And I hope that you will look up um, a few of his speeches on YouTube. Now, I will say this. Bayard. Uh, how can I say this? <laughs> Bayard may not be everyone's cup of tea. I'll put it that way. He may not be everyone's cup of tea, but everyone's story, I feel, um, is worth sharing. And it's worth telling, even if you don't agree with their way of doing things completely. You can't deny that if it wasn't for Bayard, that March on Washington would not have been as legendary as we still consider it to be today. There are three ways to deal with injustice. One is to accept it slavishly, or one can resist it with arms, or one can use nonviolence. The significance of nonviolence is that finally one depends upon his body and his spirit. He puts that into breach when everything else fails. Secondly, because the man who believes in nonviolence is prepared to be harmed, to be crushed, but he will never crush others. This is what the Southern Leaders Conference mean when they say, in our struggle, not one hair of one head of one white person is to be harmed.